Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Probably getting ready for lunch, but uh, I'm sorry to stand between you and lunch. Um, for those of you that don't know Oceana, we're an international ocean conservation organization. We're dedicated to restoring and protecting the world's oceans. And our oceans are in big trouble. Right now, carbon dioxide is making our oceans more acidic. Um, it's pushing corals and possibly other marine life to the brink of extinction. The only way to stop this from happening is to shift to that clean energy economy we've been hearing so much about. And the oceans can actually be part of that solution. Um, the oceans can provide us with some of the clean energy we need to get away from fossil fuels and actually cut some of that carbon dioxide emissions that is making our oceans sick and causing lots of other problems in our climate. But somehow, after this year's big spill, baby spill, and as you heard from Susan Shaw, all that it killed, baby, killed, we're still hearing this national chant of, yeah, what is that about? What if we could change that national chant to something like, turn, baby, turn, or spin, baby, spin? You know, the, the oil industry is telling us the only way out of our economic woes is to drill for more oil and gas. It's the only way to create jobs. Suggesting that we somehow have to choose between a healthy environment and jobs. And of course, we know that's not true. We can choose between dirty jobs and clean jobs. We can choose between oily jobs and green jobs. When I spoke at the TEDx oil spill not too long ago, I shared Oceana's 2020 vision, which was a way we could take all that oil we're getting from the Gulf of Mexico and replace it with clean energy. And it was a method that could be scaled up to actually not just replace Gulf of Mexico oil, but also to replace Persian Gulf oil. But today I want to talk about another source of oil that we absolutely do not need. And that's oil from the, Mid -Atlantic, from the Atlantic coast. We absolutely do not need to be drilling for oil and gas on the Atlantic coast. And if, in case you don't know, this is something the oil industry is really pushing for. Um, it's something the Obama administration has signaled an interest in possibly pursuing, but something that we at Oceana strongly oppose. You know, a lot lives in the Atlantic. We have whales, dolphins, corals, seabirds, sea turtles, even some commercially important fish like these bluefin tuna. In fact, the Atlantic supports major fisheries and tourism economies. It also happens to be a prime location for offshore wind. Because of the more shallow depths on the Atlantic compared to the Pacific, um, it's a great place to build offshore wind. But if we build oil and gas on the Atlantic coast at the same time, that will compete with our ability to realize all of the potential offshore wind has to offer because these two industries compete for things like investments, parts and supplies, maritime expertise, even the installation vessels that are used to install oil and wind. And when they compete, prices go up and it gets more expensive. It would be much more efficient to figure out which of these energy sources has more to offer and capitalize and focus on that one. But how much wind energy could we really get from the Atlantic coast? And how does that compare to the oil and gas that's out there? Well, Oceana set out to answer this question. And we found that we could, build, we could get more cleaner, uh, we could get cleaner, more affordable energy from offshore wind and create more jobs when we compare it to the offshore oil on the Atlantic coast. So I'm going to talk about that. In fact, we could generate as much energy on the Atlantic coast with offshore wind. It would be about half as much as all the energy that we generate in the Atlantic coast states now using all of the other sources of energy. In many states, we could generate more energy than those states use, than those states get from fossil fuels. And in some states, we could actually generate more energy than they're even generating in the state as a whole using all of their fuel sources. And so in theory, we could replace a lot of fossil fuels with offshore wind in the Atlantic coast and do away with a lot of the carbon dioxide that's causing so many problems. But how does this compare to the oil that's out there and the gas that's out there? Well, this is a difficult thing to compare, oil and gas and wind, because right now they're used for different things. As you know, oil tends to be used for transportation, driving our cars, and wind generates electricity, which can power our homes and our businesses. Um, but as we presented in the 2020 vision, the way to make the transition to clean energy is to move some of those oil uses to electricity and then bring in clean energy. And then that clean energy can actually power things that used to be powered by oil. And of course, I'm referring to electrifying our cars and uh, shifting homes that are still using oil in efficient form of heat to electricity. 
But when we want to compare offshore oil and gas to wind, we have to put them into comparable terms. So what we did was we asked ourselves, how much work could we get out of each? If we used each one, oil, gas, and wind, to generate electricity, how much could we get? Or if we used it to heat homes, how many homes could we heat? And finally, what if we used it to drive cars? How many, how many cars could we drive? And here's what we learned. I'll just cut to the chase. Wind always comes out ahead. And this is, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> um, we have a bias now. <laughs> but um, which I'll talk about in a minute. When we look at electricity, we found that the offshore wind in the Atlantic could generate 30% more electricity than the oil and gas that's out there. Um, that could power about 42 million homes, much more than uh, what we could get from the oil and gas. For the cars, we figured out that it could power nearly twice as much as the oil and gas that's out there, 122 or 123 million cars, which is more cars than we even have in the Mid-Atlantic. It's about half as many cars as we have in the entire United States. When it comes to heating homes, offshore wind could heat more homes than we even have in the United States, about three times more than the oil and gas on the Atlantic coast. And while it does this, it actually creates three times more jobs than oil and gas. And not only does it create more energy, we get this energy for less money. Um, we found that for about $36 billion less, we could get this wind energy compared to what it would cost us to, to get all that oil and gas. Now, keep in mind that once we use that oil and gas, it's gone. Uh, of course, the wind is going to continue to provide a perpetual source of energy, creating longer lasting jobs and actually providing longer term benefits to society. And what's not to like? Um, now, I talked about our bias, and I, I don't want to get into the methodology in depth, but I do want to point out that when we did this analysis, we were very conservative in our estimates on wind. Some people said too conservative, that we, we cheated wind, um, but we didn't want to overstate the benefits. But when, when it came to oil, we were very generous with oil in, in our assumptions, and wind still continued uh, to come out on top. And even an energy source that is so clean and unobtrusive as offshore wind seems to have a very vocal uh, cadre of opponents. I, I'm not really sure why that is, but they make a few arguments which I just want to say a few words about. One, uh, it'll spoil the view. Well, yeah, compared to uh, an oil rig or a coal plant, I don't really think so. And a lot of people think that these uh, wind turbines are very graceful, especially when you consider that they're helping to save the planet. They also say that it's not ready. Well, that's a, a great way to make sure it's never ready. It's self-fulfilling, you know? <laughs> not ready, so we shouldn't try it. We've got to start now, obviously. And they say that, well, it's intermittent, that you can't turn on the lights when the wind doesn't blow. Well, of course, we never assume that wind is going to be the only source of energy out there. It's going to be part of a very diverse energy mix for a long time. And it's only when wind becomes a large percentage of our energy mix that we have to really worry about this intermittency problem. And you know, there are things we can do in the meantime, like building better batteries and electrifying our fleet so that electric cars can actually help to store uh, wind energy and we can uh, turn on the ignition when we need to. So the other argument that they use about offshore wind is they say that it's bad for wildlife and bad for birds. And we've looked at this very closely because we actually are a conservation group. We're not one of those groups with a nice conservation name that really is an industry group. And uh, we found that there are some impacts on wildlife um, and that a lot of them can be uh, avoided in the construction and, 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 and operation of offshore wind. And those that can't be avoided, well, frankly, they pale in comparison to the impacts of offshore drilling, um, especially when you consider major spills and, and climate change. So if we can get more energy for less money and create more jobs using a technology um, that, uh, that we can that we can build in our oceans. Um, and if we can do that better without developing oil and gas and having competition from oil and gas, which we really need to be phasing out anyway, I'm hopeful that we will actually be able to change that national chant from drill, baby, drill to turn, baby, turn. <laughs>